committee will come back to order. We have Richard S. Fold, Jr., Chairman and CEO of Lehman Brothers. He's been the Chairman and CEO of Lehman Brothers since 1993, and we're pleased to have uh, Mr. Fold here to testify. Mr. Fold, it's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify do so under oath, so if you would please stand, raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that uh, Mr. Fold answered in the affirmative. Uh, we're anxious to hear from you. We have your prepared statement. It will be in the record in its entirety. And uh, we will um, we'll, we'll give you whatever time you want, uh, but be mindful of the fact that your whole statement is already in the record. So go, go, for, go ahead with your oral presentation. We usually ask witnesses to stay to five minutes, but I don't want to limit you to five minutes if you feel you need more time. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pressed and pull it close to you. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of this distinguished committee. <clears throat> Today there is unprecedented turmoil in our capital markets. Nobody, including me, anticipated how the problems that started in the mortgage markets would spread to our credit markets and our banking system and now threaten our entire financial system and our country. Like many other financial institutions, Lehman Brothers got caught in this financial tsunami. But I want to be very clear. I take full responsibility for the decisions that I made and for the actions that I took. Based on the information that we had at the time, I believed that these decisions and actions were both prudent and appropriate. None of us ever gets the opportunity to turn back the clock. But with the benefit of hindsight, would I have done things differently? Yes, I would have. As painful as this is for all of the people affected by the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, this is not just about Lehman Brothers. These problems are not limited to Wall Street <clears throat> or even Main Street. This is a crisis for the global economy. We live in a world where large investment, large independent U.S. investment banks are now extinct, where AIG and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are under government control, and where major institutions are being rescued, and where regulators are engaged in a daily struggle to stabilize the financial system. In this environment, it's not surprising that the media coverage of Lehman's demise has been rife with rumors and inaccuracies. I appreciate the opportunity to set the record straight for this committee and to be as helpful as possible in explaining why we ultimately could not prevent a bankruptcy filing. And then I want to respond to your questions. I'm a Lehman lifer. I joined as an intern in 1966 and got a full-time job as a commercial paper trader while earning my business degree at night. In 1994, when Lehman Brothers was spun out of American Express as a separate company and I became the CEO, we were a small domestic bond firm. By 2007, we had built Lehman into a diversified global firm with 28,000 employees. I feel a deep personal connection to those 28,000 great people, many of whom have dedicated their entire careers to Lehman Brothers. I feel horrible about what has happened to the company and its effects on so many, my colleagues, my shareholders, my creditors, and my clients. As CEO, I was a significant shareholder, and my long-term financial interests were completely aligned with those 
of all the other shareholders. No one had more incentive to see Lehman Brothers succeed. And because I believed so deeply in the company, I never sold the vast majority of my Lehman Brothers stock and still owned 10 million shares when we filed for bankruptcy. As I said, following the spinoff of Lehman Brothers from American Express, our business was almost exclusively in fixed income. We recognized the need for diversification, and over the subsequent 14 years, we built and acquired significant equity and asset management businesses. We established a presence in 28 countries. We also continually strengthened our risk management infrastructure. Lehman Brothers did have a significant presence in the mortgage market. This should not be surprising, though. U.S. residential mortgages are an $11 trillion market, more than twice the size of the U.S. Treasury market. Any serious participant in the fixed income business had a significant presence in the mortgage market. As the environment changed, we took numerous actions to reduce our risk. We strengthened our balance sheet, reduced leverage, improved liquidity, closed our mortgage origination businesses, and reduced our exposure to troubled assets. We also raised over $10 billion in new capital. We explored converting to a, back, a bank holding company. We looked at a wide range of strategic alternatives, including spinning off our commercial real estate assets to our shareholders. We also considered selling part or all of the company. We approached many potential investors, but in a market paralyzed by a crisis in confidence, none of these discussions came to fruition. Indeed, contrary to what you may have read, I never turned down an offer to buy Lehman Brothers. Throughout 2008, the SEC and the Federal Reserve conducted regular and at times daily oversight of our business and our balance sheet. They saw what we saw in real time as they reviewed our liquidity, our funding, our capital, risk management, and our mark-to-market -market process. As the crisis and confidence spread throughout the capital markets, naked short sellers targeted financial institutions and spread rumors and false information. The impact of this market manipulation became self-fulfilling. As short sellers drove down the stock prices of financial firms, the rating agencies lowered their ratings because lower stock prices made it harder to raise capital and reduced financial flexibility. The downgrades, in turn, caused lenders and counterparties to reduce credit lines and then demand more collateral, which increased liquidity pressures. At Lehman Brothers, the crisis in confidence that permeated the markets led to an extraordinary run on the bank. In the end, despite all of our efforts, we were overwhelmed. However, what happened to Lehman Brothers could have happened to any financial institution and almost did happen to others. Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG, Washington Mutual, and Merrill Lynch all were trapped in this vicious cycle. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs also came under attack. Lehman's demise was brought on by many destabilizing factors, the collapse of the real estate market, naked short attacks, false rumors, widening spreads on credit default swaps, rating agency downgrades, a loss of confidence by clients and counterparties, and buyers sitting on the sidelines waiting for an assisted deal. Again, this is not just a Lehman Brothers story. It's now an all too familiar tale. It is too late for Lehman Brothers. But the government has now been forced to dramatically change the rules and provide substantial support to other institutions. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and if I can be helpful to this committee in any way to understand how we got here and what our country can do to move forward, I am happy to do so. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fold. Uh, without objection, the chair and the ranking member will control 10 minutes, which they can use or reserve and use at a subsequent time. Hearing no objection, that will be the order. Chair will uh, recognize himself. Uh, Mr. Fold, uh, the committee, our committee requested all the 
documents relating to your salary, bonuses, and stock sales. And the committee <laughs> staff put together a chart, which I hope will come up on the screen. Uh, this chart uh, uh, will show your compensation for the last eight years. It shows your base salary, your cash bonuses, and your stock sales. In 2000, you received over uh, $52 million. In 2001, that increased to $98 million. It dipped for a few years. And then in 2005, you took home $89 million. In 2006, you made a huge stock sale, and you received over $100 million in that year alone. Are these figures basically accurate? Sir, if those are the documents that we provided to you, uh, I would assume they are. Okay. The, the bottom line is that since 2000, you've taken home more than $480 million. That's almost half a billion dollars. And that's difficult to comprehend for a lot of people. Your company is now bankrupt. Our economy is in a state of crisis. But you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? Mr. Chairman, your first question was about this slide. Are those numbers accurate? They are accurate the way you have put them up on that slide. But I believe your number of cash and salary bonuses are accurate. The option exercises uh, the way you have them portrayed here, I believe, represent the full option without the strike price. Uh, and the only reason I exercised those options was because they came due at maturity. And if I had not exercised those, I would have lost it. There was that stock sale. Well, I'll, I'll, but, I'll, leave, the, I'll leave the record open for you to give me any changes in that uh, but list. What I would say but to basically, you, didn't you take home around four to five hundred million dollars as the head of C uh, uh, Lehman Brothers for uh, the last, um, since uh, two, 2000 to now? The majority of my stocks sir, came, uh, excuse me, the majority of my compensation came in stock. The vast majority of the stock that I got, I still owned at the point of our filing. The stock is in addition to the numbers that I've uh, uh, indicated, because those were your salary and your bonuses. Now, uh, you had bonuses, and, and in addition to that, you had some stock sales. You've lost some money on the stock that you've received as compensation, which you received as compensation on top of these other figures. So you've been able to pocket close to half a million dollars. And my question to you is a lot of people ask, is that fair for the CEO of a company that's now bankrupt to have made that kind of money? It's just unimaginable to so many people. Uh, I would say to you the 500 number is not accurate. I would say to you that uh, although it's still a large number, uh, I think for the years that you're talking about here, I believe my cash compensation uh, was close to $60 million, which you have indicated here. And I believe the amount that I took out of the company over and above that was, I believe, a little bit less than $250 million. Still a large number, though. Still a large mon yes. amount of money. You have a $14 million oceanfront home in Florida. You have a summer vacation home in Sun Valley, Idaho. Yet you and your wife have an art collection filled with million-dollar paintings. Your former president, Joe Gregory, used to travel to work in his own private helicopter. I guess people uh, wonder if you made all this money by taking risks with other people's money, uh, you could have done other things. You had high leverage, 30 to 1 and higher. Um, you didn't pay out billions of dollars in dividends, and you didn't have to pay out these millions of dollars in dividends and bonuses. You could have saved some of these funds for lean times, but you didn't. 
do you think it's fair and do you have any recommendations on fundamental reforms that would bring a new approach to executive compensation? Because it seems that the system worked for you, but it didn't seem to work for the rest of the country and the taxpayers who now have to pay up to $700 billion to bail out our economy. You, you can't con we can't continue to have a system where Wall Street executives privatize all the gains and then socialize the losses. Accountability needs to be a two-way street. Do you disagree with that? And do you have any recommendations of what we ought to be doing in this area? Mr. Chairman, we had a compensation committee uh, that spent a tremendous amount of time uh, making sure that the interests of the executives and the employees were aligned with shareholders. Uh, my employees owned close to a 30 percent of our company, and that was because we wanted them to think, act, and behave like shareholders. When the company did well, we did well. When the company did not do well, sir, we did not do well. Well, Mr. Fold, there seems to be a breakdown because you did very well when the company was doing well and you did very well when the company wasn't doing well and now your shareholders who owned your company have nothing. They've been wiped out. I'm going to reserve the balance of my time and we're going to go on to other members. Uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, if you'd um, yield me two minutes. Uh, gentlemen's uh, Mr. Fold, I, I'd like to ask you first, who, um, who appoints the compensation committee? The compensation committee uh, is now appointed by the corporate governance committee uh, of the but, board. But, but did you have a, a major role in appointing the compensation committee? I believe I had more of a role uh, in the early or mid-90s, uh, clearly less of a role these last number of years. Yeah. And then finally, of the 10 million shares uh, that you had, had in the company, that's what you have right now, 10 million shares? Uh, no. Uh, I don't have the exact amount. I think it's closer to 8 million shares, and that does not include uh, the options that expired worthless. Well, actually, they haven't expired. That are still there with a longer term vesting, but with a much higher strike price than obviously where the stock is today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shays. I want to recognize Ms. Maloney for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we are in a uh, financial crisis, and uh, we lost four major investment banks in, in uh, a week, and taxpayers have been called upon to assume a potential $1.7 billion in taxpayer liability to backstop our financial institutions. During this um, hearing today, we have seen a long list of examples of deregulation. And we have heard about the net capital rule, which was eliminated so that Lehman and other investment banks could ramp up their leverage to very dangerous high levels, putting their institutions at risk. And for almost 30 years, this rule kept investment banks from taking on debt more than 12 times the value of the bank's investments. Firms were required to stop trading if their debt exceeded that ratio. As a result, most investment banks did not take on excessive debt. Yet this uh, report in the New York Times, and I would like a permission to have it referenced or put in the record. Without objection. Uh, last Friday called the Agency 04 rule let banks pile up new debt. And many people feel that this was a major cause of the crisis. And they reference a meeting in April of 2004. And I'd like to ask you, were you at that meeting? Did you lobby for this change? Why did Lehman want to increase its leverage? And in hindsight, do you think the SEC rule, uh, uh, that changing this SEC rule was appropriate for protecting safety and soundness, the stability of our markets, and, and taxpayers' money? 
Congresswoman, I was not at that meeting, I believe, in 2004. Uh, and I do not recall if any other of my people were there. Uh, I had a chance to, while I was sitting in the waiting room, uh, I saw, I would assume, almost all of the first panel. The information about leverage, uh, I think, has been grossly misunderstood. There are two numbers. One is gross leverage and one is net leverage. Gross leverage includes, and excuse me if I get technical, if I get too technical, please stop me. Uh, close to half of our balance sheet, if not more, was what we call the matched book. Uh, the matched book was predominantly government securities and agencies that we took on our balance sheet to finance for our clients. We were one of the top U.S. Treasury government traders and financers, meaning uh, financing the U.S. government debt, and we supplied a tremendous amount of liquidity to institutional investors uh, that owned U.S. government debt and agencies. At times that was as high as 300 to probably more, 300 billion dollars. I heard some of the earlier remarks about uh, if you lost 3 or 4 percent of that, uh, for the matchbook you do not, those are government securities. So the real number, the effective number, is net leverage. So did you did you uh, did you lobby for this capital rule change, and do you think it it contributed to the financial instability and loss of safety and soundness in financial institutions such as your own that allowed this increased leverage? I myself did not lobby for the increased leverage. Did did uh, Lehman Brothers lobby for it? I'm not aware of that. I I would uh, like to ask you. Now that we have the opportunity of looking back and, and, and we want to look forward on what needs to be done, if you had to give government advice on how we could strengthen the safety and soundness of our institutions and the accountability and transparency uh, that all of us want, what would you recommend to change the system? In my written testimony, uh, I spoke about the need for additional regulation uh, and new regulation, because when the original regulations were written, it was a very different environment. I believe there were 10 million shares a day traded, and today they're close to 5 billion shares traded. The electronic connectivity today, uh, not only within this country, but country to country. Investors today, given that electronic connectivity, have the right to move their money to the highest returning asset. And money moves very quickly and freely. So it's not just about regulation within the U.S. I believe it's also about more of a matrix regulation that is more global in nature. I would focus also on capital requirements. Capital requirements meaning more capital for less liquid assets and a more robust understanding of mark to market, which I believe is one of the pillars of the new plan. Mark to market during periods of stress, uh, create one set of numbers, and obviously in a 
functioning non-credit crisis environment produce another set of numbers. Thank and you. Um, uh, your, rec your prepared statement, which has these recommendations, are in the record, and we want to move on to other questioners. Did you want to add one last point? Yes, please. Uh, and the other uh, is uh, something that I strongly believe in is the creation of what I would call a master netting system uh, where all capital market counterparties uh, download each night all their transactions to one local uh, spot first in the U.S. and then eventually, hopefully, make that be global. That's about all transactions and trades. It's about positions. It's about capital. It's about leverage. <coughs> Excuse me. And it would give whatever regulator is then in control of that master netting system a complete view of the financial landscape, the available capital to each and every asset class, flexibility within those asset classes and vulnerability within those asset classes and vulnerability of one institution versus the next. Uh, what I am proposing is clearly expensive, costly, but by comparison to the unprecedented regulation that this Congress has just passed, uh, it is a fraction, and I believe money well spent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Micah, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, looking at, uh, well, your first your comment um, on uh, Lehman Brothers uh, primarily dealing in some, most, for most of its history. And sir, I apologize. I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. thank you. As, again, you, when you opened your statement, you said that Lehman Brothers, and it was around for, what, 150 years, uh, uh, dealt in some pretty uh, hard assets and some uh, secure investments. Um, you've been around a while. What, what uh, turned the corner for you to get into some of the more speculative uh, ventures like subprime and some of the other, um, again, riskier investments? As I said in my verbal testimony, uh, our participation in the, in the mortgage-related businesses uh, was clearly a natural for us, given our dominance and fixed income. That was something that went back a number of years. Uh, and even as I listened, as I say, to the panel before me, uh, they correctly pointed out that this was a goal of the government to provide funding uh, and mortgages to a number of people that typically uh, would not or could not have received a mortgage. And, and one of your big, comp well, one of the big packagers or the competitors, so to speak, was Fannie Mae, which was deep into this. And uh, you, were, you were dealing in some of the paper, I think, uh, for secondary markets and other uh, securitized mortgage uh, paper uh, to, to basically package it, make money off it. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what what was Lehman Brothers' exposure to the debt of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and what role did their collapse uh, ha play in uh, precipitating some of your financial troubles? It, what, our, it didn't matter? It, you, our exposure to well, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was de minimis, sir. Okay, but their collapse, uh, did that help precipitate any problems with your firm? It certainly set the stage for an environment, uh, as I talked about, loss of confidence and 
credit crisis mentality uh, that permeated our market uh, clearly set, set the stage for investors losing confidence, uh, counterparties asking for uh, additional collateral, uh, and clearly an environment mm -hmm. that lost liquidity, I noticed which is the lifeblood of the right. capital market system. I noticed uh, some questions were asked about your political uh, participation. I pulled Lehman Brothers' contribution, contributions to federal candidates for, uh, for the last uh, 10 years. Fortunately, I didn't find my name there, but <laughs> so, so, not like uh, some of the other me uh, members of Congress. I added some of this up. It's about uh, $300,000 that you gave to influence uh, uh, members of Congress. I also got uh, your personal, uh, which wasn't much. Uh, you probably bet a little bit too much on Hillary, too. Uh, but uh, th this, is, this is pretty much the extent of your financial contributions. I, to members of Congress to I, lobby. I believe that that was uh, okay. a result of Lehman's PAC, right. which was not corporate monies. Right. Right. I'm just telling you. No. But, but the, wait till you hear this one. Uh, and you, if you haven't discovered your role, you're the villain today, so you got to act like the villain here. But uh, uh, Guess what Fannie Mae did uh, in the same period of time? $175 million in lobbying contracts over 10 years. Does that surprise you? You were out lobbied. So it sounds like other, rather than just some greed on Wall Street, we had a little greed in Washington. Uh, what would you say to that? I think that's more of a matter for your committee, sir. Well, Gentlemen's we, time has expired. Thank you. Uh, we now go to uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Fold, I, I really appreciate that you began your testimony by taking full responsibility for the company's downfall, which occurred on your watch. But there are some concerns that I want to, to get to. Um, as you know, the American taxpayer, many of them, our constituents uh, just, uh, we just passed legislation giving $700 billion to rescue Wall Street. Um, one complaint I have heard over and over again from my constituents was that there seems to be a complete lack of accountability. They see Wall Street executives like you walking away with millions of dollars. And it is very interesting when you were talking about the chart that Mr. Waxman was uh, showed you on the board. You said that uh, it was inaccurate, uh, but I'm going to discount it for you. And instead of 448 uh, million over eight years, let's say 350. How about that? 350. Is that okay? Can we discount it a little bit? You said it was not accurate. What would you say is accurate? I'd say that's closer, sir. Okay. I want to ask you about one of the emails obtained by the committee on June 9, 2008. A former top Lehman executive, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Benoit D'Angelin sent an email to Hugh McGee, who was the global head of investment banking at Lehman. The email says that many bankers have been calling in the last few days and the mood has become truly awful. It warns that, and I quote, all the hard work we have put in could unravel very quickly, end of quote. And it offers the following advice. It says some senior managers have to be much less arrogant and internally admit that major mistakes have been made. We can't continue to say we are great and the market doesn't understand, end of quote. Mr. McGee forwarded this email to you on the same day and explained that it was representative, representative of many others. When you read the email, and this is interesting, what was your reaction? I'm just curious. I'm sorry, sir. What was the date of that? I'm sorry. Uh, that would be June 9, 2008. You, you remember that email? I do not. Well, let me, let me try to refresh your recollection a little bit. Let me tell you what you did, since you don't remember the email. 
here's what happened. You, you didn't take any resp personal responsibility. Instead, uh, three days later, Mr. Fold, on June 12, you fired Aaron Allen, your chief financial officer, and Joseph Gregory, your chief operating officer. But you know, but you, you, you stayed on and admitted no mistakes. You were CEO. Why didn't you take responsibility? Like today, you said you took full responsibility. Why do you take responsibility for Lehman's mistakes? Why did you continue to say, quote, we are great and the market doesn't understand? In your testimony today, right here, right now, you continue to deflect personal responsibility. You cite what you call a litany of reasons for Lehman's bankruptcy. Mr. Fold, I want, you to, I want to ask you about your personal responsibility since you've taken it. Do you agree that Lehman took on excessive leverage under your leadership? Please answer yes or no. It's not that easy. I will say to you our leverage at times was higher, uh, but as we entered this more difficult market over this last year, uh, we continued to bring our leverage down so that even at the point, Congressman, on September 10th, when we announced our third quarter results, we had grossly reduced our balance sheet by close to $200 billion, specifically around residential mortgages and commercial real estate and leverage loans. Mr. Fold, Mr. Fold, I've only got, I've got about less than a minute. I've got to get this question in. I assume your answer is no. I'm just giving you the benefit of the doubt. At the end of the day, we work hard. Our leverage was way down. One All right, let the, me ask you my best, Sorry, sir. One what? of the best leverage ratios on the street and our tier one capital was one of the highest. So you feel, you feel comfortable with, with, with that, that, what you did. Is that right? That's not one of the things that you said you're... Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Do you regret spending $10 billion in Lehman's cash reserves on bonuses, stock dividends, and stock buybacks as your firm faced liqui uh, liquidity crisis? Do you regret that now? I heard some of that while I was in the other room. I think that is a misunderstanding, which I'd like to clear up. Well, let me go back to... Go ahead. You go ahead. I'm sorry. Because it's important that this committee understands exactly what that was. When I talked about my employees owning close to 30 percent, what's typical of Wall Street is you take a percentage of your revenues and you pay your people. We asked our employees to take a big percentage of their compensation in stock. And so what that $10 billion was, we had close to $19 billion of revenues. What most of that $10 billion was, was compensation to our employees that they received in stock with a five-year forward vest. So they didn't get that stock until five years, which aligned our interests, our being employees, with the interests of shareholders. To avoid dilution, because we took that $10 billion, gave it to the employees in stock, we had to take the $10 billion that they didn't get and go back into the open marketplace and buy back that stock so that we did not dilute our shareholders. And we did it each and every year. From where you sit, it looks like we just spent an extra $10 billion. That is not, sir, what we did. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It sounds like, though, and I yield myself time here, that you were trying to not to dilute the payment to those employees while you were in a liquidity crisis. Wouldn't it have made more sense to use that money to pay off the debts that you were uh, uh, that were heavily on your shoulders at that point and you knew that you were in a difficult situation? At that time, at the end of the year, last year, I didn't believe that we had that problem. 
You didn't believe you had a liquidity problem. And we did not have a liquidity problem at the end of last year. We had just completed a record year, uh, none of which, by the way, came from mortgages. And we paid our people fairly in what we thought was competitive with the rest of the street. Okay, I, I accept your answer that you didn't think you had a liquidity problem, so you were trying to make sure your employees were fully compensated. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fold, in looking at your written testimony, um, you say ultimately what happened to Lehman Brothers was caused by a lack of, of confidence. Um, I have a different view, and I have a couple questions for you uh, about. What really comes down to, as we're hearing, that the subprime crisis, the predatory lending crisis, the mortgage foreclosure crisis. Now, you said you listened to the first panel um, and their testimony. I'm going to summarize it I heard, briefly. I for heard you. most of it, but yes, sir. Uh, they said that there was a period of easy credit, that housing prices were escalating and then declined, that there was securitization of mortgages, that houses became like ATMs where people withdrew their equity, and excessive CEO compensation. That's not necessarily our experience in Ohio. Um, I'm sorry, that's not what? That is not necessarily our experience in Ohio. In, in 2001, my community held a series of hearings on then subprime lending, predatory lending at the behest of uh, City Commissioner Dean Lovelace. And we found that in many instances, what we were seeing in the escalation of foreclosures was a result of inflated property values at the time of loan origination. In fact, we then turned to the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center in our community, an agency that was helping people who were in the foreclosure crisis, and Jim McCarthy from there reports that over 90 percent of the people that they were dealing with were actually refinances and that many of them had issues of the original value of the property at the time of refinancing, uh, where the, the property values were inflated. Now, Clearly, we are in a period now of, of decline or, or slow growth in some areas, which is compounding the problem. Uh, but I think that people are getting off too easy when we say that, that uh, declining property values are the problem. And I want to tell you what, what um, my, my concern here is. I believe that if you issue a loan at origination where the loan value exceeds the property value and that you then issue securities based upon that loan, and you don't disclose that gap that existed at loan origination, that you are, in fact, I believe, stealing. I believe that we're in this series of situations where people aren't disclosing that at loan origination, in fact, there was already a gap between value and loan amount, and that the declining house values really just emphasize it and, and, and compound it. So I have two questions for you. The first is, do you believe that if mortgage-backed securities are issued and they do not disclose at origination that the original loan amount exceeds the property value that it's stealing? And secondly, would you please describe Lehman Brothers' role in both issuing subprime loans and mortgage-backed securities? I do not believe that any of the original mortgage securitizers uh, knowingly at the point of origination would have taken a mortgage whose value was in excess of the value of the home. I find that very difficult to either understand and, or and, believe. And if it, and if it occurred? If it, if, it, if it did occur, uh, I would say it was lack of understanding of what the real value was. Uh, but I don't think I can't talk for the world in general, clearly. Uh, but highly unlikely that anybody would do that purposely. Then could you go to the role of, of your company and actually issuing original loans and then mortgage-backed securities? We, we actually owned a number of originate, what we called origination platforms, uh, but those were more wholesale, where we went around to individual groups or companies of brokers 
uh, that did in fact originate loans uh, when we bought them. Uh, we changed management. We changed underwriting standards to make them much more restrictive, uh, to improve the quality of the loans that we did in fact originate, so that those loans that we did then put into securitized form uh, would be solid investments for investors. So then would it be your testimony that none of those original loans that were issued by your company exceeded the property value at origination? Congressman, in all fairness, I did not review each and every loan. I must tell you the truth on that. I did not. And it would be a misstatement for me to say that because I thought I had heard you say that no one would, would do that. And, and I, I said I can nobody, tell you that the experience in Ohio is that is exactly what was being done. I would say no and one I, would do it knowingly. And since you were at the top of the organization, I, I really wanted to get your perspective of how something like that could be happening. As I go through neighborhoods in Ohio and see abandoned house after abandoned house, where so many times the American dream of having a home had been stolen from people in refinancing where they did not understand the transaction they were in and where the value at origination was inflated making them captive to the House, ultimately leading to foreclosure. Let me clarify that if I can. I said nobody would knowingly do that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. <clears throat> Thank you. I want to associate myself with the remarks and questions of my colleague from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Fold, uh, I have here a copy of a memo uh, from April 12, 2008, that you uh, sent, it's an email that you sent to Thomas Russo. It says you just finished the Paulson dinner. Uh, you, uh, this is a memo. That you, did you have dinner with Mr. Paulson back in April? I very easily could have, sir. Okay. Well, this memo references it. Did you? Did you? I don't talk? believe. I don't believe it was just the two of us. Uh, but did you? Did you meet with him? You're asking me specifically on that date. Did, did you did you talk to Mr. Paulson on a regular basis? We had a number of conversations. Okay. Sir. Now, would you tell me this memo says that uh, Mr. Paul uh, that you sent to your colleagues said we have a huge brand with Treasury. Speaking of Treasury, loved our capital raise. Do you feel at any time in this process that Mr. Paulson misled you? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. At, in response to this, do, do you feel at any time in these conversations, we have your telephone logs, that you were misled by the Treasury Secretary? No, sir, I do not. And do you feel then, you know, on September 10th, you had a conference call with your investors. During the conference call, your investors were told no new capital would be needed, that uh, Lehman's real estate uh, investment property, uh, inv investments were properly valued. Five days later, you filed for bankruptcy. Did you mislead your investors? And I remind you, sir, you're under oath. No, sir. We did not mislead our investors, uh, and to the best of my ability at the time, given the information that I had, we made disclosures that we fully believed were accurate. Well, I, and I, I should go, and I, I should go, go back to something here. You know, you you have a memo here where you say that uh, Mr. That Secretary Paulson wanted to implement minimum capital standards, leverage standards, and liquidity standards. These seem to be some of the things that got your company in so much trouble. Now, did he, did he ever tell you in all the conversations you had with him that he decided not to implement any of the proposals he discussed with you uh, last April? And does any part of you feel that you were double-crossed by the Secretary and he was playing uh, you off against, let's say, Goldman Sachs? I would sincerely hope that was not the case. And what about these uh, things that he said to you about minimum capital standards, leverage standards, liquidity standards? 
Did he ever tell you he decided not to implement any of those things? You talk to him on a regular basis. What can you tell this subcommittee to enlighten us about where Secretary Paulson was and you, as the head of Lehman Brothers, did you rely on anything that he told you that could have put Lehman Brothers down? We instituted ourselves our own plan for reducing leverage, our own plan for increasing liquidity. And I will note that on September 10th, uh, when we pre-announced our earnings, we had $41 billion of excess liquidity. Well, let me ask you this. When did you know that J.P. Morgan was going to make a $5 billion collateral call? When did you first know about that? I know that they had had conversations with our Treasury people. When? Uh, I'm not sure of the date, you know, but it, it was, it was... Mr. Chairman, it was, uh, if I may, thank you, sir. You're not sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a central question here because with J.P. Morgan, you know, making a $5 billion collateral call and, uh, and on September 10th, they were telling investors they didn't have any more need for capital, that the real estate invest, uh, investment were properly valued. This puts us in a position where one of two things is possible. Either they were lying to their investors or they were misled by Secretary Paulson as to what could be done to help you. Because after that uh, $5 billion cap collateral call, uh, that's what led directly to uh, Lehman Brothers going down. Isn't that correct? Didn't you go down right after you understood that, that they were not going to remove that collateral call? When you say collateral call, that's not the same thing as a margin call. I'm talking about they, a collateral call. No, I know. But the collateral call was not to meet uh, a deficit in collateral that they were holding to offset risk. The collateral call, I believe, was because, as, as our clearing bank, uh, they just asked for additional collateral to continue to, to clear you. for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fold. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Uh, excuse me also, I should, I should clarify also, sir, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I, this is probably a subject for, for litigation and it's probably appropriate that I leave it to that. I believe the creditors and J.P. Morgan are having a conversation. Mr. Tierney. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Full, thank you for uh, joining us here this afternoon. Just before Lehman went into bankruptcy, uh, you were in conversations with the Korean De Development Bank, uh, which I believe is a South Korean lender. Uh, what amount of money were you looking for them to contribute to Lehman? Congressman, our conversations with KDB as, as one of uh, five banks in a consortium uh, stretched over a number of months. Okay, can you tell me the, the amount that you were looking for from the consortium? It wasn't so much that we were looking from them. Uh, their original proposal was they wanted to buy in the open market uh, close to 50 percent of our stock. And the, uh, it was not about giving us new capital. They wanted to buy close to 50 percent. Uh, and was that type of arrangement something that you were looking for at that time? I would have welcomed that transaction, yes, sir. Now, at about that time, and looking for that kind of a transaction, 
you knew, uh, because uh, you had known for some time, that you were already in a precarious situation. And I say that because there were reports that as far back as Christmas in 2006, uh, that you were uh, telling people that you had a cautious outlook for the year ahead. Uh, the next month in January, when you were at Davos at the World Economic Forum, you were reportedly telling people that you were really worried about the risk inherent in the property valuations and excess leverage and the rise in oil and, and commodity prices. Uh, is that be f fair to say that you were of that, that mind around January of 2007? I was clearly focused on oil, yes, sir. Then I, I think we go back to the situation, knowing that you, you were in that stage of mind, in December of 2007, at the end of that year, um, there were payments made out, both cash and stock bonuses, uh, to your employees. Uh, and they total about $4.9 billion. So is there any thought given at that point in time to say to your employees, this isn't the time to be handing out $4.9 billion in cash. We've got a liquidity issue here. Uh, we've been seeing it coming for all year long, and we're going to keep that money in the company liquidity for the benefit of our shareholders, for the benefit of the public with whom we deal, and for the economy. At the end of 2007, uh, I did not believe at the time that we had a liquidity problem. Uh, and our most important assets uh, in the firm are clearly our employees. Uh, they are the ones that touch the clients every day and do business every day. I understand. I'm a little shocked. I mean, a lot of other people thought that you had a very precarious position. At the end of 2007, you thought everything was fine? We had just completed a record year, sir. And you, well, I can, if you want to, I do want to cover that for a second. The record year that you just completed and the reports on that had some, according to one account, had some uh, rather aggressive and bizarre accounting practices on that. And they list out four or five things that they thought were strange. You, you listed a $722 million paper profit on level three equity holdings. It's stock that doesn't trade publicly. There aren't liquid markets out there. You claimed a 9% profit on them. Uh, at the same time, Standard & Poor's index on publicly traded stocks fell by 10%. That was what made you, you seemingly had a record year. One of your short sellers, Mr. David Einhorn, uh, said that he was told uh, by your chief financial officer that $400 to $600 million came from writing up the value of electric generating plants in India. He thought the value was somewhere around $65 million, not $400 to $600 million. He also said Lehman shows some $600 million of profit uh, because of the decline in the market value of your own debt obligations. And sort of assimilate that to the fact of permissible accounting, surely enough, but it's like the, house, the uh, profit that you make when your house is foreclosed for a value that's lower than your mortgage. And lastly, he said another $176 million uh, was on your books by almost doubling to uh, some $365 million the value ascribed to certain mortgage servicing rights. In other words, the value you get paid for servicing mortgage holders' collection of payments and doing their paperwork, which are sort of tricky things to value. So I know that at the end of the year, maybe your books look like uh, they were good, but if those are the reasons for that, uh, then I think it's questionable why $4.9 billion is going out to the employees and bonuses, cash and stock, and why you're spending another $4 billion buying some of that back. Uh, and I think one of your investors here today very clearly said he was horrified to find out that you were doing that. And that's, that's why I raised the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just note, uh, Mr. Full, that in January of 2008, there was a presentation to your board uh, on which you serve by uh, Eric uh, Eric Felter, and he said very few of the top financial insurers have been able to escape damage from the subprime fallout, and a small number of investors accounting for a large portion of demand li liquidity can disappear quite fast. So I just want that to be on the record. Uh, we we'll now go to uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, and Mr. Fold, we are so pleased that you are willing to come and sit on the hot seat and uh, admit that uh, you take full responsibility. We heard from the first uh, panel's view on what caused this financial crisis, and one key factor was deregulation or inadequate regulation of big financial entities like yours, Lehman Brothers. I would like to get your view on this topic 
because as a publicly owned broker-dealer investment bank, Lehman was subject to a number of SEC uh, regulations. The company was required to report important financial information to shareholders, and you were required to meet the basic SEC requirements to make sure that you were adequately capitalized. Is that correct? Yes, Congressman. And in your written statement, you explained that the SEC and Fed conducted oversight of your balance sheet. As you stated, they were privy to everything that was happening. Is that correct? Yes, Congresswoman. Uh -huh. But, Mr. Ford, uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Your investors and your creditors lost hundreds of billions of dollars. And the failure has had a widespread impact for the rest of the economy. Would you agree that the current regulatory framework and the way they were implemented in your case failed? Are you asking specifically about the SEC? Yeah. The regulatory framework. Specifically about the SEC? Yes. Because I had said in my written testimony uh, that I thought the overall regulatory system had to be redone. But so you will agree that they failed? But specifically to the SEC, uh, we had extensive dealings with the SEC. Uh, they actually had dedicated and knowledgeable people actually in our firm overseeing a number of our daily activities. Uh, I went to them, our firm went to them, uh, specifically talking about naked short selling. Uh, they were constructive and positive. Uh, we went to them with an idea of creating something that we call SPINCO. SPINCO was the was a was an new independent entity into which Lehman would place some number of commercial real estate assets along with a piece of capital and then spin that, which means give that to our shareholders, uh, which we believed uh, would have created true shareholder value over a longer period of time. Uh, this actually was a model that I believe yeah. could have uh, been very helpful and instructive yeah, I'm uh, watching uh, our timer there. So uh, let me just say that uh, we've learned how Lehman Brothers relied on an unregulated bond rating agency whose conflict of interest gave them every incentive to rate your company's risky bonds as safe investments. We've heard how housing and banking regulators failed to curb the predatory lending abuses in the subprime market, and we have heard about how the net capital rule was implemented so Lehman and other investment banks could ramp up their leverage to dangerously high levels, and we heard that the FEC uh, is underfunded, uh, understaffed, and led by a chairman who either was unable or unwilling to enforce even the basic uh, laws on the books. Do you think this deregulation and lack of oversight contributed to the meltdown on Wall Street. I cannot talk to what. Do you think it contributed, and my time is almost up, to the meltdown on Wall Street? I cannot talk to what the SEC did with the other firms. Do you think it contributed, or are you wholly and solely responsible I actually, for the meltdown on Wall Street? I actually gave the SEC high marks for trying no, to be constructive. Okay, here's my bottom line question. Then if I'm all sorry, the things I just uh, spoke of uh, you think were just fine and work like they should, the regulations, then it's your total responsibility in, for the failure of Lehman Brothers. In retrospect, in retrospect, it's easy to go yes, back. Yes, no. 
Yes, no. My time is up. If you're, totally asking, your if you're asking me, do I... The gentleman's time is up, and Mr. Fold, you, I, I'd you like would to, be permitted to answer the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you're asking me, did the regulatory framework uh, contribute to, or the lack of regulatory framework contribute to where we are today, I would say yes, and that's why I think we need to thank, redo. Thank you. Thank you. That's the answer I was trying to get. That's to. why I think we need to redo the regulatory framework. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fold, uh, there appears to be uh, inconsistencies between your public statements and the private information you were receiving internally. Uh, let me read you some of these uh, inconsistencies and ask you to respond. In January of this year, Eric Felder, one of your top executives, made a presentation to you and the Board of Directors. He talked about the company's finances and observed that, quote, very few of the top financial issuers I'm have sorry, been able I didn't to hear escape. that. Sorry. I'm sorry. After, after Felder, I didn't hear that. Yeah. He talked about the company's finances. He, is, he observed that, quote, very few of the top financial issuers have been able to escape damage from the subprime fallout, end of quote. He then warned you explicitly that in the current environment, quote, liquidity can disappear quite fast. But that's not what you were telling the public. In December of 2007, in a press release, you said, quote, our global fr franchise and brand have never been stronger. My question is, why didn't you say publicly what you were being told internally, that you had to be careful because your liquidity could disappear quickly, which was, in fact, what happened? Mr. Felder's presentation was when? January, you said? December of 2007. January. January. 2007. Correct. Of uh, this year. We actually listened very carefully to Mr. Felder. Uh, and I believe the record book will show that we reduced our balance sheet, we reduced our leverage, we raised capital, we increased liquidity. So we did listen. Let me show you another internal document. Uh, this document uh, is a document that your attorneys produced to the committee. It's from June of 2008, Sorry. six months later. This is a set of talking points describing what happened over the past year and why your company posted record billion dollar losses. This is an internal document that was never made public, and it seems to admit the truth about what was going on. It asks, this is your internal document, why did we allow ourselves to be so exposed? And then it spells out the reasons. Quote, conditions clearly not sustainable, saw warning signs, did not move early fast enough, not enough discipline in our capital allocation. But that's not what you told the public that month. Here's what you said during an earnings call with investors on June 16th. Let me discuss our current asset valuation on those remaining positions. I am the one who ultimately signs off and am comfortable with our valuations at the end of our second quarter. Because we have always had rigorous internal process, our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger. Mr. Fold, I don't see how you could say that. Your internal documents said that conditions are clearly not sustainable and that you did not move earlier fast enough, but you told the public, Lehman had never been in a stronger position. How do you reconcile your public statements with the company's internal assessments? Was this my document? These are documents that your attorneys provided the committee. I didn't mean that. Is this my document? Is this, some, is this a presentation that I gave? These are documents internally that went past your desk in the past six months. This document does not look familiar to me. Uh, and if it was an internal document, uh, it was, I really can't speak to that because I, this document is not familiar to me. Yeah. Well, these documents were made. But if you tell me it's mine, I believe you. And ultimately, you're responsible. And this uh, inconsistency with public statements made conveying 
a strong position and internal documents showing a direct contrast to that assertion I think is very troubling with respect to the issue of trust and confidence. According to your lawyers, I am looking very carefully at this that you either wrote or reviewed. I am looking at this very carefully, sir. This does not look like my document, nor does it look like a speech that I gave, nor does it look like anything that I reviewed. These are your documents. Thank Excuse you, me, sir. These are your documents. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Shea, you wish to yield two minutes to, uh, okay, to Mr. Micah. Let me get down to uh, some of the heart of this. Uh, it uh, said, I guess a lot of the collapse occurred on the 9th and 10th of September. Uh, uh, you were trying to find $5 billion to back up your transactions. Uh, I recommend to everybody the Wall Street Journal today. They did an excellent job, better than the committee, of going through some of the public and, and private uh, statements. Uh, I, w I wouldn't necessarily pay for it. Maybe you could get it online. It's two bucks. Uh, but uh, it does outline what you were going through. One is uh, uh, J.P. Morgan asked you for the $5 billion. Uh, layman executives claimed that they had a restructuring plan and then you had discussions uh, that night you wanted to go into a conference call. Your counsel said not to go into a council call. Maybe you could tell us about that. At, on the 10th, uh, however, you told investors we are on the right track to put these uh, last two quarters behind us. Now, people want to know if you defrauded investors. I mean, I'm going to be blunt here by coming out and saying that as opposed to what happened on the 9th and you, you knew or were told you weren't going to get the money? As I said before, I'm not, I'm not really sure when that conversation Yeah, but you had to know at some point you weren't going to get the $5 billion. I mean, the Korea, the attempt to get the money from Korea was... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about J.P. Morgan. I apologize. Okay, but you were trying to get money. Uh, well, J.P. Morgan wanted the money, and you were trying to find the bit five, three to five billion, right, to keep the ship afloat. Two very different things. Very different things. Well, this is on the 9th. Well, J.P. Morgan, as I said before in answering one of the other on questions... On the 9th of September, you needed five billion to keep the ship afloat. You were told and your counsel told... Uh, well, uh, also advised you not to, to go ahead with a conference call to disclose this internally. Uh, but you came out on the 10th and said we are on the right track to put these last two quarters behind us. That's what you said. Again, I'm, I'm just reporting. Correct. Uh, in our September 10th analyst call, uh, I firmly believed that we put the last two quarters behind us. We had done a tremendous amount. I don't want to go through the whole thing all over again, but lowered our leverage, raised capital. Uh, you heard it all were before, so I'm not going to go gonna, through it again. You, were you told the night before you weren't going to get uh, be able to cook the deal? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what that refers to. What Getting what, the money to keep the laymanship afloat. What we said at, on, on September 10th was that we had adequate capital. Uh, we talked about a plan that involved spinning off those commercial real estate assets and that we were going to have to put capital into that. On the call, people talked about how are you going to fill that. We talked about the sale potential sale of IMD, either all or some, which would have created $3 billion of tangible equity. 
I think if you go back and look at the third quarter announcement, you'll see that. Uh, possibly more if we had sold it for a higher price. We had plans at the time to go to some of our preferred holders and convert some of those preferreds to equity uh, because we had to pre-release uh, because of the rumors about our company. Uh, we didn't obviously have a chance to complete some of those plans. We didn't know how much capital we were going to need to equitize Spinco. We didn't know how much of the commercial real estate assets would be sold. But that was all three months out. On that Wednesday, we had $41 billion. We had plenty of capital to operate. All conversations about additional capital were about what we were going to do when we took capital and put it into the new Spinco. That was all three months out. And that was obvious to shareholders. That's what we were talking about. And there were a number of questions from analysts at that time uh, about that. So there was, there was disclosure about where we were. And I believe understanding. And there certainly was no attempt to again, mislead anyone. Again, before the committee, under oath, uh, the night before, uh, uh, September 10th, when you made that statement, uh, did you in fact know that you weren't going to get the estimated 3 to $5 billion to keep the ship afloat? Congressman, again, I say I'm sorry. Those are two very different numbers. One is additional collateral for our clearing bank. I only got two minutes. I, I, I know you're looking for an answer here. That is not capital. That is collateral. Two very different things. We believed we were going to raise, quote, that $5 billion by either selling all or part of investment management, or the sheer fact that we were going to spin those assets off, then we didn't need that much capital. The five billion was additional collateral that J.P. Morgan was asking for. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. McCollum. Uh, Mr. Did I answer that, Ms. though, for you, sir? Mr. Chair, point of personal privilege. <coughs> yes. How would I go about yielding to the gentleman from Tennessee so he can make a flight? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear I what would you like, How would I go about allowing time for the gentleman from Tennessee to go ahead of me so he can uh, catch a plane? Oh, well, then why don't I just recognize him now? Thank the Chair. Um, Mr. Fold, in your testimony on page 8, you say what happened to Lehman Brothers could have happened to any firm on Wall Street and almost did happen to others. But it didn't happen to the others. There's a difference. And you cite many factors in your testimony about how it could have been different, you know, if regulators had behaved differently or if different things had happened. What could you have done differently personally that might have changed the fate of Lehman Brothers? With the benefit of hindsight, sir, uh, going back a couple of years, I would have made some changes to how we looked at and thought about our mortgage origination businesses, uh, our commercial real estate business, uh, and probably our leverage loan business. Those were three of the areas that, that over the second and third quarter created some losses. Uh, and I believe in my verbal testimony I said, Given the opportunity to look back, I would have done things differently. Uh, should I close those businesses down uh, then? I think people would have looked at me and said that's irrational to have done that. Uh, but knowing what I know today, 
that clearly could have been a smart move. But, but given the information that I had, that's not the decision I made. Well, that was decisions you could have made two or three years ago. Given your book of business in 2007 and 2008, were there decisions you could have made to have changed the destiny of Lehman Brothers just in the immediate past? We did make aggressive decisions to close some of the mortgage origination businesses. Uh, we had substantial hedges on our residential mortgage positions. Uh, in retrospect, I think we were slower on commercial real estate. I, like a number of other people, thought the mortgage crisis was contained to residential mortgages. There were a number of people, uh, many experts included, uh, that also thought that. Uh, and I was wrong. And looking, and looking back now at that information, uh, I thought it was contained. We thought it was contained. Uh, and experts thought it was contained. You mentioned being, quote, slow on commercial real estate. Does that mean uh, correctly valuing the portfolio of commercial real estate properties? No, sir. It does not mean anything about valuation. It means about how quickly uh, we thought about disposing those assets. Mm -hmm. And I think the record book will show that we went from 50 billion of those assets to 30 billion, keeping the remaining, and I shouldn't say keeping, but ending up with 30 billion that eventually would go into either 30 or less, depending on how much of the remaining 30 we sold in the fourth quarter that remaining piece going to Spinco to be spun to our shareholders, which we firmly, which we firmly believed had real value. Mm -hmm. You had a committee, the Finance and Risk Management Committee, which I believe was chaired by the once legendary Henry Kaufman. Uh, a previous panel said that this committee only met twice a year in 2007 and 2006. Were they giving you advice on these long-term strategic directions? Uh, let me just clarify one thing, if I may. Uh, I believe they did meet twice 2007, but they met four times this year so far. Well, it's over now, so it's four times mm -hmm. this year. Were they giving you advice on changing strategic direction for the firm? We talked about assets, uh, and not just at the risk uh, and finance committees. We talked about it at the board. Uh, we talked about how we were bringing down our exposures on, on residential and on, and on commercial and on leveraged loans and almost at each and every board meeting, uh, whether it was a risk committee or a finance committee, uh, we talked about it. Uh, it was clearly a subject uh, on everybody's mind. Uh, keep in mind that this was a board that did have a lot of uh, financial experience. This was a strong independent board. I was the only uh, Lehman person on the board. Uh, these people, some of these people ran, ran banks, IBM, uh, other companies, Selenies. Uh, these were, these were experienced people and they had never any reservations about giving me advice uh, and having a view about the markets. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Time has expired. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I thank the committee for allowing Mr. Cooper to move forward. Uh, my constituents in Minnesota understand that you don't have to do something illegal to do something wrong. Imperfect federal regulation isn't a license for unethical behavior, especially when it puts taxpayers at risk. 
are in our current regulatory framework, there's a gray space between legal activity and illegal activity. And in that space, financial firms can make a choice to either obey the letter of the law, but not to honor the spirit of the law. Twelve years ago, and you've been with the firm for 42 years, according to your testimony, Lehman Brothers Holding, Inc. sent a vice president to California to check out First Alliance Mortgage. Lehman was thinking about tapping into First Alliance Mortgage uh, lucrative business of making subprime loans. The Vice President uh, Eric Hebert wrote in a memo describing First Alliance as a financial sweatshop, specializing in high pressure sales for people who are in a weak state. First Alliance, he said, the employees, and I quote, leave the eth their ethics at the door. The big Wall Street investment bank that was Lehman Brothers, decided First Alliance wasn't breaking any laws, and Lehman went on to be uh, the lending mortgage company, and you did about uh, $500 million worth of sales and more than uh, $700 million worth of bonds. In other words, Lehman Brothers is an example of how Wall Street's money and experience could have been used to prevent us being in this sub Price mortgage history. We should learn from it. You, uh, in your statement, and I quote from it on page five, you said, we did everything we could to protect the firm. And so I go back to this memo uh, that Mr. Bishop had up and ask you if you agree with the spirit of the memo. Why did we allow ourselves to be so exposed? Did you answer, ask those questions? Um, did you reflect that conditions were clearly not sustainable? Did you see warning signs? Did you move fast enough? And I ask that because of two things that have come to my attention. That the Federal Bureau of Investigations has launched uh, preliminary inquiries as to whether or not Lehman or ex is executives committed fraud by misrepresenting the firm's condition to investors. So, sir, I want to ask you some questions. On September 10th, five days before your bankruptcy filing, you and your chief financial officer, Ian Lowett, held a conference, for an, conference call for investors. According to the Wall Street Journal, you were advised by your bankers not to hold this call because there were too many open questions. It's my understanding that at the time you did make the call and that you were frantically trying to raise capital, either through new investors or selling off assets. So when you and Mr. Lowett spoke to your investors and you said that you, you did not need more capital and that Mr. Lowett said to investors when asked whether Lehman would need to raise $4 billion, quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, we don't feel that we need to raise that extra amount. Our capital position at the moment is strong. So, sir, is this accurate? Were you told not to hold the call? Were you trying to raise capital during the week before you filed bankruptcy? And is it an accurate statement that your capital position was strong on September 10th? It is correct that our capital position on September 10th was strong. Did anyone tell you, advise you, against holding the conference call I referred to? That should be a yes or no, sir. Well, you're asking me, did anyone? I mean, I. I... So that's a pretty big call that was made I mean, five days before filing bankruptcy, and your chief financial officer was present on the call. I ask you, did any of your outside bankers or other advisors warn you against making, holding this call? I had so many conversations. I, I would never say to you that no one. That well, would maybe, be sir, maybe you'll remember. Were you trying to raise capital during the week before you went bankrupt? The week before, two weeks before, three weeks before. Sir, I asked we you the week before. I, I'm, I'm just saying, asking you for the week before, I'm saying sir. yes to all. You're saying yes to all. Yes. And when you were raising that capital, no, no, no one, you're, no like one in finish, your firm. Though. I'd like to finish because there's a different piece to that. What we were looking to do was to raise capital 
after we completed. You were raising capital. Excuse me, please. After we completed the spinoff, which would probably have been January, after we had completed the spinoff of the commercial real estate assets, on September 10th, we had a strong capital position. We were trying to anticipate how much capital we were going to put into Spinco, how much capital we were going to use. We were trying to anticipate how much we would sell the investment management division for. So there were a number of moving pieces. But on September 10th, given the business that we had, we had sufficient and strong capital and liquidity. Thank you, Mr. Fold. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Mr. Van Hollen, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fold, you said earlier in your testimony that at Lehman Brothers, when things were going well, then people would do well, and when things weren't going so well, then people would have cutbacks. And I have to say that I think people looking in have concluded, based on the compensation structure, that when things went well, people did really well. And when things didn't go well, they still did uh, very well. And I'd like to call your attention uh, to a memo uh, that was written on September 11th, 2008, uh, just four days before Lehman Brothers uh, declared uh, bankruptcy. And I hope someone can uh, provide you with a copy of, of the memo. Uh, it's a proposal uh, from the Compensation uh, Committee, uh, your CC'd on the, on the memo. Uh, and it talks about compensation for two employees uh, of Lehman Brothers. Uh, one was Andy Morton. Uh, I assume you recognize that name? I do, sir. Okay. He, was, he was the previous global head of fixed uh, income. Uh, it said, the document here says he was involuntarily uh, terminated. Uh, the memo here proposes to give him an additional $2 million uh, cash payment. Uh, the other official mentioned in the memo uh, is Benoit Savare. I assume you know him as well, is that I right? I do indeed, sir. Uh, who used to be Lehman's chief operating officer of Europe and the Middle East until he was terminated. He was also, according to this memo, involuntarily terminated, and yet this memo proposes to give him a $16 million a cash payment, again, just days before Lehman Brothers uh, declared bankruptcy. These are two individuals who have been involuntarily terminated. I think the normal sort of parlance is fired. Uh, and yet uh, they are being given combined about $20 million uh, in additional compensation, despite the obvious poor performance at this point, which nobody can deny. Uh, and I ask you, is that, is that appropriate? I mean, I mean we're, we're here having this conversation with you and, and the American people. Is that appropriate that four days before Lehman Brothers declares bankruptcy, uh, that two individuals who have certainly been part of the decision making that led to the decline would be given uh, $20 million in additional compensation? There were two pieces to that, clearly Andy Morton and Benoit Savare. Uh, Andy Morton was given, I think it's two million. Yes. Uh, and we felt that that was, or more importantly, compensation committee felt that that was appropriate uh, for his years of service. The sixteen million, sixteen point two million was not a severance payment. This, uh, the 16.2 million was a contractual obligation that the firm had made uh, to Mr. Savare. Uh, I forget when it was, but it was earlier in the year. And that, con that, that contract said that at any time, if terminated, uh, he was due the items of the contract. 
So that's that's what that was. That was not a severance payment, sir. Regardless, regardless of his performance, he would be due that amount of money. Is what you're saying? Unless it was unless it was fired for cause. Let me let me let me ask you this. Uh, you would agree, uh, would you not, that uh, you you people can make decisions that in the short term maximize profits and bonuses, but are bad decisions for the long term. Is, I mean, there, there are decisions that can maximize short-term profits, but people would also agree that they might not be the best long-term interests of a company. Isn't that right? If you're referring to this gentleman, no, I'm just referring as a general proposition. You would agree that there are times when you can maximize short-term profits, but if you looked at it over the longer term, people would agree that it was not a good long-term decision. You would agree that there are some decisions that fall into that category. Certainly not by design, but okay. in retrospect, clearly. Okay. Sometimes let me that ask, happens. Let me ask you with respect to clawbacks, and I'm not talking about anything with respect to Lehman Brothers, but just as a proposition. Wouldn't you agree that it's appropriate that if somebody makes a decision uh, that raises short-term profits and therefore bonuses, and that, but then it's later shown that those same decisions resulted in harm to the company, that on behalf of the shareholders, and certainly in cases where the public is now involved, that the shareholders or the public should be able to go back in and get a clawback and take those bonuses or additional payments back that are proven with the benefit of hindsight to have been bad decisions for a company and the shareholders. That was actually one of the things I spoke about when I said interesting way to go, go forward is a long-dated compensation system. Uh, in our case, that's exactly what we had. We had a long-dated compensation system. Uh, look, I am not proud of the fact that I lost that much money. But it does show that the system, our compensation system, did work. I left 10 million shares plus a whole number of options. I say I'm not proud of that. But when the firm did not do well, I was probably the single largest individual shareholder. I don't expect you to feel sorry for me. I don't mean that. That's not my point. My point, though, is that the system worked. Let me, Mr. Chairman, if I could. I mean, you're, you're now referring to shares that you owned, which obviously when the company went bankrupt went down. I'm also referring to bonus payments that may have been made in previous years to executives, including yourself, when now that the company has gone bankrupt, wouldn't it make sense to have provisions to protect shareholders, not just to, uh, clearly when the shares go down, the value of the company goes down, the share value, do, but wouldn't it make sense to have clawback provisions with respect to bonus payments, cash payments, so that the shareholders could recover those monies that were bonuses for what clearly proved to be bad decisions? If you could answer that briefly, Mr. Fold, then we'll move on. I'm sorry, if sir. you want to answer that briefly, you may, but we, we have to move on. Our compensation system was specifically set up, even, even for me, in 19, oh, excuse me, in, uh, in uh, 2007. Eighty-five percent of my compensation was in stock. I lost that. Okay. All stock that I got for the last five years, I lost that. Actually, compensation that I received Back from 1997, 8, and 9, I went to the Compensation Committee and said, I believe we should extend the vesting on this. I could have gotten it seven years ago. I went to the Compensation Committee and said, this should be extended to a 10-year vest. I lost all of that. I'd like also for this committee to know that before the end of our second quarter, I went to my board and I said, I think we're going to have a tough quarter. We were talking about how we were going to pay the troops, as I called it. I said, I want you to take me out of it. I believe, given this performance, my recommendation to you is that I do not get a bonus. I'd like this committee also to know I got no severance. I got no golden parachute. I had no contract. I never asked for a contract. I never sold my shares 
that's why I had 10 million, because I believed in this company. I believed that this company, and that's why I said, I'm glad I got these last two quarters behind us. I believe we're on the right track. I could have sold that stock. I did not, because I firmly believed that we were going to return back to profitability and get back on the road. Thank you, Mr. Fold. Thank you, Ms. Van Hall. <clears throat> Mr. Sarbanes, you recognize five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that you believed in this company, but I also believe that your uh, belief in the company at a certain stage began to cloud your judgment. And uh, let me ask you this first off. When you say to the public our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger, that is intended to convey the overall strength of the firm and the company, is it not? In other words, you, you can't assert that a company is not strong if you're asserting that its capital and liquidity positions are strong. Our capital position was strong. Our liquidity position was strong. We had completed a whole number of things that we did to protect the firm. So the firm was strong is what you were intending to communicate with a statement like we that. Had I'll go through it again with you if no, you like, sir. But we, we reduced firm, our leverage. Our was tier the firm one strong? Was the firm strong? Was that the intended communication in saying our capital and liquidity positions have never been stronger? It was to convey that the firm was strong, right? My what message. Else could it, well, my I'm me going to assume that that's me. what it was intended to convey. And I think the problem that we've had here is that statements of this kind. Um, at the time they were made, were simply implausible. So it then raises a question of whether your perspective on the health of the firm was clouded um, or whether there was something else going on. Now, I'm going to leave that aside because I want to move to a different question. You talked about how uh, Lehman got into the originating business. Um, and I gather did business with a number of originators. Uh, First Alliance uh, was one, for example, uh, for some period of time before you then actually took an equity stake in those, in those businesses. Is that correct? Uh, we took an equity stake in uh, BNC Mortgage and also Aurora. A uh, group in uh, Europe called uh, Elk. Yes, sir, okay. we did. But those were firms that you or companies that you've been doing business with for some <coughs> period of time before you then took the next step of of uh, uh, taking an equity position. I mean, you you, you did some business with them, we so did. you knew how they operated. We did some business. You with then them. said earlier that at the time you bought them, you changed management changed underwriting standards and took other actions designed to um, pull back on the very risky nature of the way they were conducting business, which I respect, although there's some evidence that the practices continued nonetheless. Um, and I guess that's an admission by Lehman that the standards that were being used up to that point, in other words, by those companies when you were doing business with them but had not yet bought into them, were not adequate standards. Now, your, um, one of your vice presidents, this was mentioned briefly, uh, went to California to, to kick the tires on First Alliance and came back with a memo saying these sorts of things. First Alliance is a financial sweatshop specializing in high pressure sales for people who are in a weak state. And let me just mention, my primary concern with all of this and Lehman's an example, it's not the only uh, example, it's an example, is that what was happening was the thirst for more originated loans upon which you could build an empire of derivatives and slice and dice up the chain to make more money. The thirst for those got pushed down the chain and encouraged people to look the other way in terms of 
standard conventional uh, underwriting uh, standards and so forth. Uh, which then created a culture and atmosphere in which predatory lending could flourish. And I think that's what ended up happening uh, to the detriment of, of, of millions of homeowners across this country. So sweatshop was one description. He said First Alliance was the, quote, used car salesman of blemished credit lending. They made loans where the borrower had no real capacity for repayment. And at First Alliance, it is a requirement to leave your ethics at the door. And in spite of this, uh, Lehman went ahead, invested in the company, and there's other evidence, I may run out of time because I want you to respond to this, there's other evidence that these sorts of practices and ethics uh, continued even after First Alliance was purchased or you took some kind of ownership stake uh, in First Alliance. How could you consort with this kind of an operation uh, given how lax those, those uh, standards were? I'm not sure if we took an equity stake in First Alliance, but that doesn't answer your question at all. Uh, we actually spent some time with First Alliance. Uh, I believe that was in the mid-90s, and I think in the late 90s we extended financing to them. And we worked with them to change underwriting standards. Uh, in the case of the ones that we bought after, BNC and, and Aurora, uh, we acted more as a conduit. That means we went to them and bought their production and their, their, their production of mortgages. And in that, we began to understand their business practice. Our name became associated with them, we realized the best way to handle that was to buy them, if our name was going to be associated with them, buy them, change the management, and change the underwriting standards. And that is what we did. And that is why we did it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, there is some evidence that it didn't change, but I will accept that answer. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Welch, uh, thank before, you, Mr. You, before you start your questions, um, I want to just for uh, housekeeping purposes, ask unanimous consent that all the documents that have been referred to in this hearing be made part of the record. And we'll and we'll certainly leave the record open for, for questions from members for written responses. Without objection, that'll be the order, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fold. Thank you for being here today. Uh, this is a tragedy unfolding all across America, and we're only beginning to feel the pain. Uh, and I know you sit here as the chief executive uh, of a company that has a proud history, 158 years, did some tremendous things, and I've known some employees at your company, and they're terrific, and 28,000 employees now don't work at Lehman Brothers. Uh, you had to count $700 billion, I guess, and uh, I'm not going to beat you up about your, your salary here, but I want to ask a couple of questions. Number one, it seems that Wall Street uh, and Lehman, along with others, turned what was a basic, simple transaction that was a step in reaching the American dream, and that is a family buying a house and me being able to do that by borrowing money on a mortgage. And it was a straight out transaction oftentimes between a neighbor who was a community banker and a just wide-eyed young couple oftentimes uh, being able to afford their first house. That got to be turned into a commodity. It got put on steroids with these uh, subprime mortgages. It then got securitized. And as long as the real estate values in this country were going up, uh, fueled by low-cost credit, it was a house of cards that would stand until the first whiff of a downturn. In retrospect, do you believe that this process of securitization, of easy credit, of convincing people who couldn't afford a mortgage, particularly when the rates were re-triggered, was a house of cards that was bound to fail in retrospect? Seeing it as I, as I see it now, uh, is that, is that uh, a yes? I'm not, I'm not sure I would say it was a house of cards. It was, uh, 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll go none of us I, ever expected yeah. housing prices to decline with the depth and violence that it did. Right. So, I mean, th what I understand the problem you had is that you didn't get out fast enough and delever fast enough, and the market went faster than you were able to make the, the actually, adjustments. Uh, you know, actually, Congressman, that was not the case. Residential mortgages were not our problem right. at the end. Let we me had, ask you a couple of questions. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I only have five minutes. I want to ask you a little bit about AIG. I mean, there was a whole series of, of, of bailouts, and then uh, Mr. Paulson made the decision uh, that when it came to Lehman, there was going to be no governmental assistance. So, in fact, Lehman Brothers was treated differently than some other financial industry giants that were in similar circumstances. And obviously the Treasury Secretary made a decision for reasons that uh, he can explain. But let me ask you this. Uh, my understanding is that you did have pretty regular contact, telephone contact with Mr. Paulson and probably uh, some individual meetings. And, the dis and, and I also understand from reports in the New York Times that uh, Goldman Sachs, in fact, was a major trading partner of AIG, about $20 billion on the other side of contracts. Did you have any concerns that there may be some uh, arbitrary reasons why Lehman Brothers, facing similar predicaments as AIG, was allowed to fail, whereas AIG was the beneficiary of an $85 billion uh, bailout uh, sponsored by the Treasury Department? Well, I clearly would love to have been part of the group that got. Do you have any, well, do you have any views on that or any thoughts on that? why you were allowed to fail. You, Lehman Brothers, were allowed to fail and AIG was bailed out. That was a, de that was a decision that was made that Sunday afternoon and no, night. I, I and, know that. I'm and, just wondering. And I was not there. You've got to be wondering. You're the head of this company. You want to keep it going. And I understand from you, everybody knew you were dedicated to the survival of Lehman. Until the day they put me in the ground, Exactly. I will wonder. And you got an email, as I understand it, uh, from, from uh, uh, someone in your office, Mr. Humphrey, I think, uh, about the Jarrett Waite situation uh, and, and telling you that Mr. Waite had stopped by and commented in just a few weeks on the buy side. It's very clear that GS, uh, Goldman Sachs, is driving the bus with the hedge fund cabal and greatly influencing downside momentum, Lehman and others. Thought it was worth passing on. What was the meaning of that? as you understood it. This was from a, per, a, a, a business associate ally of yours, correct? By the way, I don't blame you for asking the question. That's what we're asking. What Mr. Waite was talking about was that, uh, evident, obviously, that uh, Goldman Sachs was involved with the hedge fund community. Uh, well, that's the short selling, right? Greatly influencing the downside momentum of Lehman and others. And that refers to short selling. I, I, have, I have no proof of that at all. No, I understand. Well, let me, I'll just ask you your opinion. Do you think that there was any justified reason why Lehman was treated one way, namely allowed to fail, and uh, AIG, uh, just as an other example, uh, was given $85 billion in taxpayer assistance uh, to bail it out. I do not know why we were the only one. Is there any rational that. business reason why there would be a distinction made between the predicament that Lehman faced and the predicament that AIG faced? I actually, I must tell you, Sunday night, or more importantly, that weekend, we walked into that weekend, uh, I firmly believed we were going to do a transaction. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I think that Lehman and Merrill Lynch were in the same position on Friday night. Uh, and they did a transaction with Bank of America. Uh, we were, went down a road with Barclays. That transaction, although I believe we were very close, never got consummated. 
Well, I thank you, and uh, you know, I feel bad. I know you do for the for those folks at Lehman and uh, your oh. investors and shareholders. Let me just let me just speak to that for a second because <clears throat> you know we talk about what happened at Lehman, and we talk about. whose fault and why wasn't I on it and my employees, my shareholders, creditors, clients have taken a huge amount of pain. And again, not that anybody on this committee cares about this. But I wake up every single night thinking, what could I have done differently? And it's been going on. What could I have done differently? In certain conversations, what could I have said? What should I have done? And I have searched myself every single night. And I come back to at the time, and that's why I said this in the beginning, the time I made those decisions, I made those decisions with the information that I had. Having said all that, I can look right at you and say, this is a pain that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Regardless of what comes out of this committee, regardless of what comes out of when the, when the record book it's finally written. <coughs> that's, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Shays. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fold, thank you. I know it's been a, a long day, and, uh, uh, but we're coming to a close. I, would, uh, I have a variety of questions, and let's see how well we can get through them. Uh, first off, what we're doing is we're trying to see what happened. We're trying to see who is responsible, uh, and to determine uh, who is responsible, and that includes Congress, ultimately it must, um, and, and what being responsible means. So I'm going to end my question, and I'll tell you now, by telling, having you tell me the significance of the fact that you say take full responsibility. That's going to be my last question. Uh, but I need to know what that means, and I don't want it now because I want to ask a few other questions. And, and then we're going to look at what do we do to change the systemic the system. And we are the oversight committee. I'm also on the financial service committee that will come up with solutions. Now, we had Enron and WorldCom, and every part of the system broke down. The directors didn't direct. The managers didn't manage. The employees didn't speak out. One spoke out privately, didn't speak out publicly. The law firm was uh, uh, duplicitous and, uh, and part of the problem. The accounting firm uh, was part of the problem. Uh, you had uh, the rating agencies, everybody, every part of the system failed, so we passed Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, and amazingly, uh, Fannie and Freddie were not under that because they're not under the 33 and 34 Act, therefore they weren't under Sarbanes-Oxley. So um, two huge organizations were never under the very system we put in place with Sarbanes-Oxley, much less all the other laws that were required, but that's, that's just a footnote. Um, what I want you to speak to is uh, uh, the highly leveraged. It, it strikes me that Wall Street was incredibly blasé about risk, including yourself, that, um, that 30 to 1, uh, you, you didn't leave yourself enough to deal with the potential run on a bank, and that when you gave these bonuses, uh, you just made it less likely that you would have the kind of reserves you needed, which strikes me, obviously, in hindsight, as reckless. But people were saying, as we were going through the system, we have too much leveraging. Um, I kind of responded, well, <clears throat> you know, the hedge fund folks will tell me, you know what, it's the really wealthy people and they can absorb the risk. They know what the risk is. They know it's huge leveraging. But what we know now is Wall Street can bring down Main Street. And uh, frankly, I'm going to tell you, it's a little scary. Because um, we don't even know 
uh, all the folks that have been impacted by Lehman Brothers going down. I mean, we know stockholders, shareholders, uh, clearly employees, but all the different folks who had uh, resources held by your company. So uh, what I want you to do is speak about risk. Why did we get into this position of, of having such high leverage? And, and um, was it just too easy to make money that way? And, and so we just said, the risk be damned? We certainly did not say, risk be damned. I believe Lehman Brothers had a robust risk process. As far as the leverage, and I spoke about it earlier, there's a very big difference between the 30 times and where we were uh, when we finished in the third quarter at 10 and a half. A big, a big piece of what that 30 was, again, was the matchbook which was governments and agencies. So that should not be considered uh, as an additional piece of risky leverage. And again, I will say that on September 10th, we finished with the best, or one of the best leverage ratios on the street, and one of the best tier one capital ratios on the street. And even to your question, that's how, that's how I viewed the company and that's why I viewed it as strong, Mr. Congressman. Uh, I mean, those, those, those were the metrics. Those were the metrics that the yeah. regulators yeah. used. Those yeah. were the metrics that all of us in the industry used. Okay. And ours were one of the best. Let me ask you about the rating agencies. What kind of relationship do you have with the rating agencies? Uh, you end up having to pay them to determine uh, your value. Describe to, them, to me, describe to me, do you have any financial relationship with the rating agencies? Yes, sir, we do. Okay, and tell me that relationship. On securitizations, for example, we go to them with the components of a potential securitized deal, the mortgages, valuation, loan to value, right. and geography. Then, and, and, and you pay them for that. Uh, they charge us a fee for right. a rating. And how can we feel comfortable that the very people of paying them are the very people they're evaluating. That was one of the things on my list of things that should be included in hopefully tomorrow's reform. Okay. Let me just uh, quickly go to executive compensation. I mean, this is the largest irritant, frankly, to the general public. And when I got my MBA at NYU, I read a book, The 5,000 the people who run America, the 1,000, I forgot what it was, but it was the people who run a company are on the board of three other companies or two other companies. So they help decide the compensation of someone else and someone else helps decide the compensation of them. Do you really feel comfortable that the compensation committee can uh, objectively evaluate you, what you and others should get when in fact you have some real say in who they are and uh, well, I don't need to say more. There, there was nothing shy about my, or the firms, more importantly, the firms or the board's compensation committee. They had access to uh, outside experts and they used it. They had access to uh, other firms, uh, competitive data. Uh, they were independent. I just want to make one comment to that. And I find, I find no, I mean, I, I was not on that board uh, or I'm, I'm just on that group. I'm just going to end by saying, it, to those of us on the outside, it seems a little screwed up. Um, and it doesn't seem to us objective, and, and that's my closing comment. And I appreciate you being here today. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes wanted additional time, and the chair still has additional time, so I yield you uh, two minutes. Um, really, this is just to, to add something to the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, getting back to the First Alliance issue, because you talked about how uh, once you took an equity stake in it, and the evidence is that you did do that, that you put new management, that the practices ceased, and so forth. Uh, but the record is that even after you would put hundreds of millions of dollars in there, uh, Mr. Hibbert, the same Vice President who had warned you about these practices before, indicated that First Alliance was still violating the Truth in Lending Act. In 2000, First Alliance went bankrupt. In 2002, the Federal Trade Commission charged First Alliance with systematically cheating elderly homeowners. The next year, more than 7,500 homeowners sued Lehman and First Alliance for these same tactics, <clears throat> where most lenders were charging fees of one or two points for a loan. Your company was charging 25 points. The jury delivered a $50 million verdict against First Alliance and specifically found that Lehman Brothers, quote, substantially assisted First Alliance in perpetrating the fraud, uh, end quote. And in light of that, it's just difficult to conclude that Lehman didn't know uh, what was going on in terms of this subprime um, activity. And I just wanted to add that to the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's statement is part of the record. Mr. Fold, we've uh, completed the questioning by the members, but I, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I know this wasn't easy for you to be here, and I uh, accept the fact that you are still haunted every night, as you said, uh, by the, 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 wonder, the wonder, wondering whether you could have done something different, uh, whether this could have had a different ending. Uh, but I must say that statement you made that the system works because you lost the value of some of your shares really doesn't sound right to me. Because the system that you lived under gave you a very, very generous reward when your company was highly leveraged and, uh, and everything was going up. And that's the American way. But when the leverage meant that you were taking huge losses, when the values were not uh, holding up, you still got substantial compensation. And I just say that most Americans don't understand, even if you, I, we thought you made $500 million. You say you only made around $350 million. That just seems to me an incredible amount of money. Uh, We've held hearings on executive compensation, and we've found some conflicts of interest with these compensation committees. We're going to hold a hearing on the ratings, uh, the groups that do the ratings for these uh, uh, bonds, because we think that that ought to be explored more fully. But if you walked away with even $350 million, and your shareholders got nothing, and the taxpayers have a system now where we put up $700 billion, and the American people are looking to see are they going to come out of this? This is another day with a deep loss on Wall Street. We're, we're just completely battered by the, the failure of our economic system as it sh has shown up on the Dow and the ability to get credit. So something is just not right to say that the system worked as it should. That system didn't seem to be the system that makes sense and I still think that we've got to look for ways to change it. Mr. Shays, do you want to make any closing comments? Uh, just to say that I look forward to the next four hearings, and I, I do hope that we do get right in the thick of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Thank you. What I didn't hear from you, Mr. Full, was you took responsibility for the decisions you made. In retrospect, you think you should have done some things different, but you don't seem to acknowledge that you did anything wrong. And that, I think, is also troubling to me. Thank you very much for being here. That uh, concludes our hearing for today, and we stand adjourned. Before we fail off the billionaire.